Okay. It is a great pleasure uh, to be chairman in this slot. Uh, we start with the first uh, uh, speaker, Yavar Kian from University Dax Marseille. Um, um, Yavar is a very excellent uh, dynamic uh, uh, expert in a young expert in inverse problems, uh, study many aspects of inverse problems, for example, evolution uh, equation, hyperbolic, parabolic, also elliptic um, inverse problems, all, also uh, Calderon problems. Uh, um, he is also an expert uh, of um, um, shedding equation and the reconstruction of, for this kind of equation. And uh, um, he, uh, he uh, was uh, visiting in many important uh, institutions and has many important collaboration. Now uh, he uh, speak about the determination of a nonlinear term for reaction diffusion equation is a joint work with Gunther Ullmann. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here at this conference. Thank you also for the invitation to give a talk. So as Giuseppe said, the, the title of my talk will be Determination of Nonlinear Term for Reaction Diffusion Equations, which is based on a joint work with Gunther Ullmann. So through this talk, I will try to explain the different aspects that appears in this title and the, no, the results that I would like to describe to you. So I will start this talk by uh, a brief introduction to inverse problem and mainly what they will mean through this talk by inverse problem. In order to understand the idea of inverse problem, we need first to explain the idea of forward problem. So for forward problem, you start with a system from which you deduce the response of the system. But mathematically speaking, you can associate with this notion of system, the one of equation, and with the notion of response of the system, the one of the solution of the equation. But this means that at some point, you have an equation, you solve it. This is the idea of the forward problem. For inverse problem, the situation is different in the sense that you have access to a system which is not fully known, which means that your system have several unknown parameters. To this, to this system with the unknown parameter, we add some information about the response of the system, so partial information that we call observation or measurement. And the idea of inverse problem is to combine all this information in order to determine the system. What remains here is to give a definition to this word determine. And through this talk, I will consider two definitions of this word determine that I will describe below by associating systematically the notion of system to the one of equation and the notion of uh, response of the system to the one of the solution of the equation. So the first meaning that I will give for this talk to this word determine is the uniqueness. So the uniqueness can be described through some injectivity property which says the, follow, the, following, uh, the following ID. So you have two equations, E1 and E2, to which you associate some unknown parameters, so P1 for E1 and P2 for E2. And to each of these equations, you associate measurement, M1 for E1 and M2 for E2. And the idea of this uniqueness result is to say that if the measurement for these two systems coincide, then the unknown parameter coincide, and by the same way, the system coincide. The second definition that we give to this word determine is the stability. So the idea of stability is to add some continuity to this uniqueness that I have described below. And instead of showing the stability into two process, starting by the uniqueness and then the continuity property, what we prove most of the time is what is called stability estimate, which consists in the idea of estimating the difference of two unknown parameters by a function f that we take as a difference of the measurement, where this function f will be equal to zero at zero. Okay, so this is a quick introduction to this notion of inverse problem. What I would like to say also is that this kind of result have many applications, for instance, in medical imaging, but also in seismology and other uh, area. And beside that, what we should think about is that we are often confronted to inverse problems. Like when we ask ourselves, where these sounds come from or where these lights come from? All these questions being actually inverse problems. 
Okay, so this is for this brief introduction to the idea of inverse problem. Now let me start with the statement of our own problem. So here we consider omega to be a bounded open set of Rn and being bigger than two. And we consider the space time domain corresponding to our domain in space time, our interval in time. We fix ourselves the lateral boundary corresponding to the boundary of our domain in space times our interval in time. After that, we, we introduce the following initial boundary value problem corresponding to reaction diffusion type of equations, which contains a nonlinear term that depend on the space variable, the time variable, and the solution of the equations. To this equation, we associate the following initial boundary value problem by fixing an initial condition and a direct boundary condition. So this is the context on which we would like to state our inverse problem. And now the goal will be to define this inverse problem through this idea of measurement and all the things that I have introduced before. So the first thing that I would like to say is that the goal of our inverse problem is to determine in terms of uniqueness and stability, and you can refer to the definition that I have introduced just before, the nonlinear term appearing in this equation, and the measurement that we will use in order to recover this nonlinear term will be information about the solution of this equation restricted to the lateral bundle. This is what we can say about the statement of our problem. Now, let me say a few words about the motivations of our problem. And I will start with some physical motivations. So let me first recall that this class of equation, which are reaction diffusion type of equations, are employed in order to describe the change in space and time of the concentration of one or more chemical substances by means of two process, that is the local chemical reaction and the diffusion process. Moreover, this equation can be used for modeling several dynamical processes appearing in biology, geology, and in physics. In this context, the goal of our inverse problem is to determine this nonlinear expression, which describes the underlying physical law of the system associated with our equation. To be a little more specific in order to understand the importance of our inverse problems, let me recall how the shape of this nonlinear term will impact the physical phenomenon, which is associated with the system at the, which is described by our equation. Indeed, depending on this nonlinear term capital F, which is associated with the local reaction, uh, local chemical reaction, uh, the physical phenomenon which is associated with our equation can take different form. For instance, it can uh, be associated with the spreading of biological population, the rayleigh bernard convection, or models appearing in combustion theory. So here, in this talk, we would be mainly interested in the case where the nonlinear term have a simultaneous dependency with respect to the space variable and the solution of the equations. So physically, this means that we want to consider a nonlinear term which admits variation inside the system independently of the solution of the equation. So what happened inside the system correspond to the inaccessible part of the system. And our goal is to determine this kind of property from excitation and measurement of the system that we will apply on the accessible part of the system corresponding to the boundary of our open set. So this is the main goal of our problem and how we can explain it physically. Now, beside this physical motivation, there is also mathematical motivation for this kind of problem, which comes first from the high nonlinearity and ill possessedness of this kind of problem. And the second idea is to extend what has been considered intensively this last decade, that is the determination of coefficient appearing in the linear equation. Indeed, if you take the nonlinear expression that we consider in our equation and you consider it in a linear framework, you can see that you get some coefficient type of expression. And the determination of this type of coefficient has been intensively considered. And here, the idea of extending this to the nonlinear framework consists in determining a more general expressions where the unknown are no longer just the space and the time variable associated with the equation coefficient, but also the behavior with respect to the solution of the equation. In addition to this, the problem that we are considering, the idea of determining a nonlinear term that admit variation inside the system independently of the solution with excitation and measurement restricted only to the accessible part, correspond to an open problem stated by Viktor Isakov in his classical textbook, Inverse Problem for Partial Differential Equations. 
Okay, so this is for what I wanted to say concerning the motivation. Now, let me go back to the position of our problem and let me introduce the actual initial bond derivative problems that we will consider for this talk. So here, in contrast to the previous initial bond derivative problem, so this one, we get rid of the initial condition. The idea will be to fix the initial condition and here we will fix it at zero. However, we still have some directly boundary condition. In order to consider suitably our inverse problem, we will consider determination of admissible nonlinear term, which will be chosen in such a way that we will have sufficient smooth solution of this initial boundary value problem. So for simplicity through this talk, I will assume that the final time of existence of the solution of this initial boundary value problem will be independent of the size of the direct input. However, in the framework of our actual work, we consider something more general. So once this is fixed, what we can consider is the following. So this direct line input corresponds to the excitation of the system. So we apply an excitation of the system at the boundary of the domain. And to this excitation of the system, we associate measurement of the flux, which correspond to the normal derivative of the solution of this initial boundary value problem that we consider on the lateral boundary. So this gives us the observation that we want to consider, which is given by the following map, which send any excitation of the system to the associated measurement. And this map will be called the excitation measurement map. And the goal of our problem will be to determine this nonlinear term appearing in this equation from some knowledge of this excitation measurement map given by the property of this excitation map, excitation measurement map, applied to function of the form constant real lambda times some cutoff function key. And this is the goal of our problem. Now, let me say a few words about what is known so far for this problem. And in order to introduce this kind of inverse problem, which, is not, which are not so much well known, I will give a general description, including both problems for elliptic and parabolic equations. So the first thing that I would like to say is that this class of inverse problems can be divided into two categories. The first category corresponds to the historical one and the classical one, where the idea actually is to determine the nonlinear term, including its shape. So the shape of the nonlinear term or the behavior of the nonlinear term with respect to the solution of the equation is also part of the unknown. In the second category, the idea is to restrict the analysis to some kind of polynomial or holomorphic type of nonlinear term and to determine the coefficient of this nonlinear term. For instance, you can think of this type of nonlinearity. In this second category, you can actually take advantage of the nonlinear interaction in order to improve this kind of result comparing to what is done for the linear equation. So through this talk, I will focus my attention only on inverse problem in the first category. However, I would like to mention few works devoted to the inverse problem that can be considered in the second category, including the work of Faiz Mohammadi Oksanen, Kupshi Kulman, but also Lassas Limatainen Bin Sal. So let me start by the description of the first result, which is one of the most important results, one of the first important results in this class of inverse problem, which is a result due to Isakov of 1993. So here Isakov consider similar initial bond derivative problem as the one that we have considered, but he has the initial condition. And here Isakov associate with this initial bond derivative problem three, the map that send each initial condition and directly boundary condition to the final time of the associated solution and its normal derivative. So if we compare this, this kind of observation considered by Isakov with the one that we have, Isakov's add to our excitation measurement map, all possible initial condition and final over the determination of the solutions. And from this kind of map, <clears throat> Isakov proved in 1993 the determination of a nonlinear term appearing in this class of uh, initial boundary variable problem. So here, the idea is that Isakov consider excitation coming from the initial condition, which means excitation inside the system on the inaccessible part, and measurement at the final time, which means measurement on the inaccessible part of the system. So with this additional data, Isakov managed to prove the recovery of this type of nonlinear term. Sorry again, can I ask something? Yes. 
So uh, it will make sense also if you if you consider the problem of Isakov from U0 to UT. One could also wonder whether just knowing the semigroup map from U0 into UT, the nonlinearity can be identified. So without using G or the normal derivative of U, right? So you see what I mean, right? Yes, I, I, I see what you mean. Equal but, uh, zero, and you just consider the semigroup uh, from say t equals zero to t equal capital T, the Poincaré map, and then you ask whether uh, this Poincaré map is able to identify the nonlinearity f. Uh, has this, this uh, simpler problem be ever uh, considered? No, but I think you will have some issue with the space dependency with this kind of approach. You may be able to determine nonlinear term. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe it has been considered, but for nonlinear term, independent of the space variable. I think your, your, the approach that you're considering have, have been, there, there has been an idea in that direction. I will talk it a little later on, but without the space dependency, you will have some- Why the space dependency is so uh, tricky in this context? Yes, 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 yes. It's why a, why, it's why is it so different when F depends on X? Because it's something close to some coefficient type of difficulty. You will have something more different and you have evolution inside the system independently of the solution. This is actually an important issue. Mm -hmm. It is Thank only you. dependent on the solution. Things are different. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the actually, so uh, the remark of Enrique is interesting because the other uh, result that I will refer to is the work of uh, Isakov of 2001, where this time Isakov uh, managed to restrict himself to the excitation measurement map that I've introduced, but Isakov treat this time the recovery of uh, nonlinear term having dependency with respect to the space variable, restricted only on the boundary of the open set. So I would like also to mention that quite recently I have been able to extend this kind of approach to hyperbolic equations. So the other result that I will refer to is the result of 2001 of Isakov, where Isakov treated this time the determination of nonlinear term depending on the solution and on the gradient with respect to the space variable of the solution in the case of dimension three. And concerning determination of nonlinear term depending only on the solution, I will, there has been actually many work devoted to the de determination of this class of nonlinear term. This is part of our previous discussion, discussion with Enrique. And among the different results, I will refer here to a work due to Shuli Wabaz Yamamoto, where the authors have been able to prove determination of this class of nonlinear term from a single measurement. So the idea is that they apply one excitation and one associated measurement, and moreover, they manage to get stability result. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, we can say so far about uh, the problem, this problem which has been stated in a different context than the one of Isakov. And for the problem considered by Isakov, one, we need to wait 2018 and our work with Murad Chuli in order to see the first improvement of this work which is given by the following one. So we managed to show that the result of Isakov is true if you consider a measurement given by this map. So if you compare this map with the one considered by Isakov, we get rid of the measurement at the final time. So we manage to restrict the measurement only on the lateral boundary, but still we need to apply excitation at the initial time. The excitation at the initial time are still required here, which means that we still need to apply excitation on the inaccessible part of the system. So in addition to this uniqueness result, we manage also to get some stability result, which consists in estimating the difference of the two nonlinear term by means of some expression involving the Fréchet derivative of this map. This is the kind of stability result that you can consider in this context. I would like also to refer to a work with Pedro Caro, where we managed to prove the determination of nonlinear term having dependency with respect to the space variable, the solution, and the gradient with respect to the space variable of the solution. Okay. Let me say a few words about this problem for elliptic equation. So in the context of elliptic equation, you deal with a semi-linear elliptic equation having a nonlinear term that we consider still with the space dependency and the dependency with respect to the solution of the equation. And this problem has been considered by two works, two important works in that direction, which are the work, the work due to Isaac of Sylvester, who have treated this problem for a dimension of space higher than three, and Isaac of Nachman, who treated this problem in the case of 2D dimension. 
And the idea is to determine this nonlinear term by mean of the directly to Neumann map associated with this elliptic equation. And in contrast to the previous result that I have introduced here, the idea is that you have only some control of the solution at the boundary of the open set. While in the previous result that I've introduced you, you have this initial condition, which allows you to have some control of the solution inside the domain. So this makes actually quite a quite important difference. And in order to overcome this difficulty, these authors impose a strong condition on the class of nonlinear term under consideration, which says that the nonlinear term are assumed to be uniformly Lipschitz. And with this strong assumption, they manage to prove the full recovery of this class of nonlinear term by means of the knowledge of the direct Neumann map. I would like also to quickly mention few results devoted to the determination of quasi-linear terms. I will start first with the elliptic equation. The idea will be here to consider equation of the form divergence of capital J, which depend on the space variable, the solution, and the gradient of the solution. So in this category, we can first refer to the work of Sum, which treated the determination of nonlinear conductivity appearing in elliptic equations, so a conductivity depending on the space variable and on the solution of the equation. This work has been extended in a joint work with Sun and Ullmann in more general framework of second order nonlinear expressions. And in the specific case of dimension n equal to two, Harvas and Sun treated the determination of general second order nonlinear term depending on the space variable and on the gradient with respect to the space variable of the solution. Concerning determination of conductivity depending simultaneously on the solution and on the gradient with respect to the space variable of the solution, one can refer to the work of Munoz and Ullmann. And finally, concerning the determination of nonlinear conductivity having dependency with respect to the three class of parameter, that is the space variable, the solution, and the gradient, with, of, the, uh, gradient of the solution, one can refer to a recent work with Kartesa, Faiz Mohammadi, Kupshi, Ullmann, where we have determined for what seems to be the first time this class of general nonlinear conductivity. Okay, so concerning parabolic equation, actually there's few results devoted to the determination of quasi-linear term. And uh, the only result that I find in that category is a work due Egger, Pitchman, Scott Boom, where these authors determine a nonlinear conductivity appearing in a parabolic equation. Okay, so let me quickly recall what I've introduced you so far for our own problem, that is the determination of a semi-linear term for parabolic equation. So first, there is the result of Isakov in 1993, where Isakov need to apply excitation on the inaccessible part of the system and measurement on the inaccessible part of the system in order to determine this class of nonlinear term. The work of 2001, uh, in the work of 2001, Isakov managed to restrict this excitation and measurement on the, on the accessible part of the system, but he can only recover nonlinear term depending on the space variable at the boundary of the open sets. In our work with Murachuli, we managed to prove semi-linear term comparable to the one considered by Isakov in 1993, but still, we still need the all possible initial condition. And what remains open so far is the determination of nonlinear term having space dependency from excitation and measurement located only on the boundary of the open set, that is the accessible part of the system. Okay, so now let me start with the statement of our own result. We will consider for this the following initial boundary value problem with a Dirichlet boundary condition, which takes the form of a constant real lambda times for the function key, where key will be some cutoff function, which will have some constant values on an interval in time of the form delta capital T, where delta will be fixed in our interval in time zero capital T. And we add to this some function h, which will be assumed to be sufficiently small. And the idea will be to consider in terms of observation, the knowledge of our excitation measurement map on the neighborhood of this class of function of the form lambda times k. So we consider this type of knowledge of this excitation measurement map. And our goal will be to determine in both in terms of uniqueness and stability, this kind of nonlinear term from this knowledge of the excitation measurement map. So for this, we need to impose condition on the class of non admissible nonlinear term that we want to recover in our inverse problem. So the first assumption that we impose is related to the forward problem, 
And the idea will be to consider nonlinear term, which will allow us to have sufficiently smooth solution of our initial boundary value problem. The second class of condition that we impose are this time related to our inverse problem. So we start with condition six, which is considered in most of this class of inverse problem, which basically say that actually zero is a solution of your equation. This assumption allows you to say that zero will be a solution of your equation. The second condition is actually the new criterion that we introduce for this inverse problem, which is a sign condition imposed to the second derivative of the nonlinear term with respect to the variable associated with the solution of the equation. And combining these two class of assumption, we manage first to get the uniqueness result. So the uniqueness results say that you pick two nonlinear term, F1 and F2, to which you impose this condition, which introduce a parameter Q that you consider here. And then what you can prove is that there exists a constant C1, which is simply positive, which will depend on the domain omega, the final time capital T, the cutter function T, and this function Q. And provided that you have this constant C1, you can show that for all R strictly positive, the fact that our excitation measurement map for each of these nonlinear term considered on the neighborhood of the function lambda times Q for lambda line in minus r, r coincide, we can show that the two nonlinear term coincide with respect to the space variable lying in omega in our domain, in the space domain, the time variable lying in the interval delta capital T, and the last variable, which is the variable associated with the solution of the equation lying in the interval minus r c1, r c1. This is the first result. And what I would like to say is that provided that all the parameter that you can see here will be independent of the choice of the parameter R that you choose here, you will be able here to send R to plus infinity and get the full recovery of your nonlinear term. The second result that we have obtained is a stability result. So this time you need an a priori estimate of uh, the nonlinear term under consideration. And provided that you have this kind of a priori estimate that uh, is uh, considered with this function key, kappa, you can show that there exists a constant C2 depending on kappa, on the final time capital T, on the domain omega, and on this cutoff function T, which appear in our measurement, in such a way that you can estimate the difference of the two nonlinear term with respect to the space variable lying in our domain omega, the time variable lying in the interval delta capital T, and the last variable, which is the variable associated with the solution of the equation lying in minus RC2, RC2. And this difference of the nonlinear term is upper bounded by an expression involving the fresh derivative of our excitation measurement map that we take on function of the form lambda times Q. So here I recall the definition of this map, which is nothing but the restriction, uh, the localization of this uh, excitation measurement map around this function lambda Q. So taking the derivative, fresh derivative of this map as zero correspond to the fresh derivative of our excitation measurement map at lambda key. So this is the kind of result that we obtain. And I would like to make a few comments about this result by saying first that to the best of our knowledge, this is the first result of determination of a nonlinear term which admits variation inside the system independently of the solution from excitation and measurement map localized at the boundary of the open set, which correspond to the accessible part of the system. Moreover, we managed here actually to recover nonlinear term that may have some time dependency, which can be associated to physical phenomenon, which may admit evolution in time. What I would like to say also is that actually the key ingredient in our analysis is this uh, new criterion that we introduced in order to be able to recover this class of nonlinear term. And this criterion would be interesting, it would be even more interesting if we do not restrict our case, we do not restrict our analysis to what I have specified a little later on. That is the situation where we impose some sign condition to the nonlinear term, which will be something that one needs, will needs at some point to consider in order to have a final time of existence, which will be independent on the size of the direct limit. So this is the reason why in the article, we consider this extended framework, a final time of existence that depends on the size of the direct limit input, but not in this topic. And thanks to that, we can actually go further than, than what has been considered by Isakov, Sylvester, and Isakov, Nachman, which is the restriction to uniformly cheats uh, nonlinear term. We can go further than that. We can consider more general and more uh, extended behavior of the nonlinear term. Okay, so 
let me say quickly, uh, so I'll give you some idea of the proof. So uh, <clears throat> the first step uh, will be to obtain the following identity. So the idea is to pick the solution of this initial boundary value problem with a direct boundary condition of the form lambda times key associated with each of our two nonlinear terms. So we consider the solution of each of these equations. And in the first step that I will not describe here, we obtain the following identity, which says that each of our nonlinear terms taken at their own solution coincide. Moreover, we can show also that each of the solution of this initial boundary variable problem associated with each of the nonlinear terms coincide. So if we combine these two properties, we can show the following. So pick R strictly positive. And for all space and time variable, define the following set, which correspond to the set of all possible values of the solution of this initial boundary variable problem for the, at x and t for the parameter lambda line in minus rr. And what we can get actually by combining the previous property is that the two nonlinear terms coincide with respect to the space variable and the time variable lying in our space time domain. And the last variable, which is the variable associated with the solution of the equation, lying on this set capital G. And now the idea will be to get information about this set capital G in order to be able to complete our analysis and get some explicit determination of the nonlinear term. And what we managed to prove here is that actually these sets contain our interval of the form minus RC1, RC1. And this is the kind of information that we managed to get from this set. And from this information, we managed to get our uniqueness result and then after our stability result. And this is actually a key point in this analysis of this kind of inverse problem. Okay, so now I will complete this talk by uh, saying a few words about some further prospects. And the first prospect that I would like to talk about is an extension of our work for this class of nonlinear parabolic equation and the determination of a semilinear term appearing in this class of equation. So the idea here will be that the key ingredient in order to have some more general condition guaranteeing the determination of this class of nonlinear term is based on the properties on, on the, of this set. That is the properties of the sets of solution of this initial boundary value problem and the behavior of this solution at x and t for this parameter lambda lying in minus rr. The idea actually will be to prove that these sets contain an interval of the form minus fr fr with some function f, which will be, which will be positive, increasing and unbounded. Provided that we can get this, we'll be able to recover this class of nonlinear term in some explicit set. And this is actually the important part of this analysis, and it is mainly based on the study of this class of initial boundary value problem. The same problem works also for the elliptic equation, while this, the result of isakov Silverstein and isakov Nachman, which uh, has been obtained 26 years ago, have been unchanged so far in terms of full recovery of nonlinear time. And the main idea, the idea is the same. You need actually to get some explicit information about these sets for the solution of this boundary value problem, where you consider the solution of your uh, semilinear equation with a boundary condition which takes constant values. Provided that you can show that you have some interval with some function j that depend only on this parameter r that is contained into this set, with this function j, which will be unbounded, positive, and increasing, you will be able to get some explicit information about the determination of the nonlinear term. And you will be able to go further than this important condition of uniform Lipschitz, which is imposed to the nonlinear term under consideration in these two works. So finally, what I would like to talk about is uh, the determination of quasi-linear term for parabolic equation. So here we consider some more general nonlinear parabolic equation, which can be associated with nonlinear convection diffusion equation, but also to Berger's type of equation with non-vanishing viscosity. So here we have a nonlinear conductivity appearing in our equation, but also a nonlinear convection term. And the idea will be to associate with this map. So here we have a constant values initial condition. The following excitation measurement map that sends any direct boundary condition to the measurement of the flux associated with the solution of this initial boundary value problem. And the idea here will be to determine the nonlinear conductivity and the convection term, which is associated to the velocity field of the moving quantities and expressed here by a nonlinear expression, by means of the knowledge of this map for all possible constant values of the initial condition. 
And the second step will be to fix at zero this initial condition and to get the same kind of result. So this last prospect, it's so based on some joint project in progress with Ali Faiz Mohammed. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Yavar, for the nice conference. Thank you. There are questions or comments uh, and the remarks? Can I ask something? Uh, Please. You, yeah, so Yavar, thank you for this very interesting talk. So, uh, uh, what I what I see in this, I mean, this is a general comment, right? So in inverse problem theory, uh, the analysis gets very far, though I often see that from a practical perspective, when people have to really do things computationally, uh, the methods are uh, based often in least square methods and rather, say, much more elementary, let me put it that way, than, than where the theory stands. Uh, have you seen any substantial progress in, in this setting? So to make uh, these analytical methods uh, algorithmic? Actually, there is uh, several uh, works in that direction. There is actually a work of Cheng and Yamamoto of 2000, which says that actually, for instance, the stability results that we obtain allows to improve this kind of least square uh, argumentation that we're talking about. For instance, the, the Tikhonov regularization by allowing to improve the choice of this kind of regularization. And at some point, the idea will be that this theoretical result gives you a direction. It says that for the one that want to compute, where do you need to compute? This is how you need to see, in my opinion, this kind of result. And the idea will be to say, okay, so you pick different type of measurement. Instead of taking it too much randomly, choose it with the direction that the theoretical result gives you. So, this is the kind of things that I, I, I would say on my side in terms of connection between the practical application of inverse problem and the theoretical study of this kind of problem. Thank you, Yavar. I think there is a question on the chat too. Yeah, there are other questions. So, oh. In the chat, there is a question by Edin Chorf. Is it uh, uh, measurement? Yes, there is. There can be an extension, but this is uh, uh, to measurement on the part of the boundary. There is, we can do something that, but this is in some work in progress, actually. <laughs> the restriction of the measurement uh, uh, on some part of the boundary. It's some work in progress. Okay. I'm Yamamoto. I'm Yamamoto. Uh, as for that, uh, Yabar, I think for yes. parabolic case, uh, independent of, of the spatial dimensions, uh, partial boundary data is possible. Yes, yes, yes. Independent on, on the space fiber, there is many works. You have actually... Uh, no, 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 no. Elliptic case, uh, impossible. More than... Yes, more, more, more difficult. It's more difficult. Yeah, but the uh, parabolic okay, I case, uh, I can conjecture any small part of the sub-boundary. Can guarantee the uniqueness. Yeah. I, I think I think so. I think, I'm not sure, but I think more actually as some result of this type. At some point. Uh, I'm no, not no. sure of that, but no, uh, no, no. For your uh, for your formulation, <laughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, yeah. the idea is that actually it is more connected to what uh, Enrique said. It's more representation of solution ID. This kind of uh, mm. non-linear term. Mm. Okay. Uh, May I ask uh, some, a question? Anna Anna Dubova. Dubova. Yes. Uh, um, Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I wonder if you have performed some numerical experiments about uh, the practical identification of some kind of non-linearity? No, uh, I have not done this, but it will be interesting to go in that direction. I would be interested to, to see what can be done in terms of numerics. As I said, uh, the idea is that the theoretical idea gives a direction, but then you need to compute it practically. But uh, this is a part where uh, the idea of this theoretical result is to say, you, okay, you need to look at that direction. But I would be interested. I never can say, but I would be interested. Okay, thank you. And another question, uh, uh, what we can say about uh, the case for non-linear non um, uh, initial data? Uh, for uh, for uh, non-zero, sorry, initial data, U0, if, if U0 is uh, not zero, 
can we say something about the identification? We can say a lot more. Actually, this is what has been considered by these authors. Mm. Uh, there is our work with uh, Murad Shuri. We have considered initial condition and the one of Isakov where we have considered initial condition. The idea is that when you have the initial condition, you know what happened on your solution at the initial time. So you have mm -hmm. much information. So yes, it, this will improve actually the result, I believe. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, yeah, but just a curiosity. In the case of nonlinear web equations. Uh, nonlinear what, sorry? Nonlinear web equations, nonlinear hyperbolic equations. Ah, there, hyperbolic. There are similar uh, results of reconstruction of nonlinear term or- You have my work. <laughs> okay. okay. There are maybe another another question by Mohamed Gattasi. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have a small question about your uh, so for the nonlinearity. So uh, I maybe I miss the assumption the nonlinearity, but my question is uh, our parabolic equation can blow up blow up in so after some times so not in this talk but in our case yes in our article yes so but the idea will be that we assume that the final time of existence depend on the direct boundary condition which will allows the blow up at finite time but the the problem is considered below this blow up this is the idea okay, okay thank you hey there are uh... Other questions, comments, remarks? If no, we thank again uh, the speaker. Thank you very much. Nice uh, conference. Thank you very much. Okay. We start with the next uh, speaker, Emmanuel Crepo. So you see my screen, yeah? Yeah, yeah, perfect. If you want, we can start. I uh, present to you and we can start, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, next speaker is Emmanuel Crepeau uh, from uh, Université Grenoble Arts. Uh, he's a... Uh, um, important expert of control theory and inverse problems. Emmanuel obtained her PhD at the University of Paris Sud in 11 or say in 2002 under the supervision of Jean-Michel Coron and work in every aspect of control theory, KDB, Cotton and Debris, um, very important um, uh, result with uh, Lionel Rossier and other uh, important papers. In this talk, uh, she uh, will speak about internal null controllability of the generalized Hirota Satsuma system. It's a joint work with Carreno and Serpa. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so, um, so this work is a joint work with uh, Nicolas Carreño and uh, Eduardo Serpa from uh, Santiago in Chile. Uh, first, I will uh, describe you the Erota Satsuma uh, system. It was described first in the early 80s. So it's a system of uh, three PDEs. Uh, of uh, Kortovec de Vries type. Um, what is important is that uh, the coefficient of the, for the dispersive terms are not the same. There is a minus sign here where both uh, v, for V and W you have a plus. And uh, those equations are coupled with some nonlinear terms except one. You have just a, a coupling, a linear coupling for, between U and W. Okay, so um, with uh, Nicolas and Eduardo, we wonder to, to know if we can control uh, this type of system. 
Um, we found no previous results on, on controllability for, for it. So we chose first to study it on a bounded domain, 0L. And we tried to impose only uh, two internal controls here, so on uh, V and on W. So here, uh, for the control on V, it uh, applies on a small uh, open subset gamma and for W on, on another one, little omega. And there are some subsets of uh, zero L. And uh, we choose as uh, boundary conditions, the usual boundary conditions for uh, KDV on uh, bounded domain. So we choose the Dirichlet boundary conditions and some Neumann conditions. In fact, we take it on the left side if uh, we have a minus sign here and on the right side here if we have a plus and with those uh, boundary conditions we can prove that the system is well posed okay so the question is can we um, prove a result of null controllability with only those two internal controls um, i will just mention two results on uh, control of KDV. In fact, there are lots of controls for, for, of uh, articles on um, controllability for KDV. Uh, I just mentioned those both uh, results because they are about uh, internal controllability. So the first one is a result of uh, Capistrano, Pazotto, and Rosier. And it deals with the single KDV equations. The boundary conditions are the same as uh, those we have chosen. And they have proved that uh, um, thanks to, so first they linearized their system around zero and the proof thanks to the usual uh, dual uh, uh, property, uh, so thanks to some Kalman estimate that uh, you can prove uh, the null controllability of this system this equation okay and um, we base there also uh, our result on this uh, article of uh, Araruna Serta Mercato and Santos it's uh, an article about the null controllability for uh, a system that couple uh, the Schrodinger equation a linear Schrodinger equation with a KDV one and um, in their article, they've proven two results. First, uh, if you control only on the Schrodinger equation, so there is no control here, you can prove that you can find a, a, a complex control. So in fact, if you write the real part on the imaginary part, you have three equation here, and you can control with a complex control. So it looks like a two controls in fact okay and if you control kdv equation then you can take here a real control so in fact they can they have proved that uh, they can control their system of free equation with only two internal controls okay and the, the proof relies also on uh, on an observability inequality obtained with Kalman estimates So for our results, we, the sketch of the proof is uh, as usual. So first we linearize uh, the system around zero. Then we prove uh, an observability inequality for the adjoint problem. And to get this observability inequality, we use uh, some Kalman estimates. And then we go back to the nonlinear system with a fixed point uh, result. So if we only analyze our system around zero, uh, what appears, in fact, uh, you have only one coupling term here. So you can see that uh, V is not coupled with U and W. So in fact, 
um, for the inner part, controlling with only two controls is optimal. You cannot uh, imagine to control with only one control as this equation is alone. Okay. So first, uh, I will call some easy uh, well poisonous results. So if uh, you take initial condition in L2 and two controls in L2 also, then uh, your linear Hirota Satsuma system is well posed and you have a unique solution in L2, H1 and uh, continuous L2. And you have the same type of, type of result for the nonlinear problem when you take some small initial data. Okay, so what is the most difficult part is uh, to, to get the observability inequality. So here I have written uh, the joint equation. And uh, so you have the uh, direct boundary conditions on the uh, Neumann condition on the right or on the left side. And what we want to prove is uh, something like that where we uh, observe only on Psi and Eta. So there is no observation on uh, the first uh, variable phi, phi. Okay. So to get this uh, observability inequality, we use some Kalman estimate. And the first part is to choose uh, the weight function. So we have chosen a, a weight uh, like that. So uh, here you have a phi zero, which is represented. So you multiply phi zero with a, a function that depends on, uh, on time as, you, as usual. So uh, the weight is chosen such that it is strictly positive. And uh, the, it is concave. Uh, outside. So here you have omega zero, in fact, the subset where you, you can observe. Uh, so it has to be concave, and uh, you have also this uh, hypothesis. So the derivative has to be uh, negative and strictly positive uh, on both sides. And you have this uh, hypothesis. I will explain later where, where it comes from. Uh, what is important to remember for the for the rest of the talk is that uh, phi chetch is the minimum of uh, phi on uh, zero L, whereas phi hat is the maximum of phi. So you have a dependence between the minimum and the maximum of uh, the weight. Okay, so thanks to this uh, weight function, we we use a, a previous Kalman estimate. Um, proved by uh, Capistrano, Pazotto, and Rosier for the single equation. So here you, I have just add a, a parameter new uh, that can be positive or strictly positive or strictly negative. Uh, just to mention here, you have uh, still the direct light boundary condition, and here it's. Uh, just to to take care about uh, the the parameter here. So here, if uh, new is positive, this quantity disappear, and you just add that uh, the Neumann condition on the left is null. Whereas if new is uh, negative, this is this side that disappears. So you have just the, the right condition, which is null. okay, and it's a, a backward in time uh, equation. So, um, Capistrano, Pazotto, and Rosia have proven this Kalman estimate. So, you have uh, the left side here. Okay, so phi, phi is your weight. Uh, X is uh, the function uh, on time. So, here you have uh, the left, uh, term, the right term here, G. And uh, you have an observation term here. That depends on uh, y and also on the second derivative in space of y. Okay. Okay. 
So we will uh, prove how Carlovan estimates our uh, inequality of observability in three steps. I will try to to give you some ideas about uh, those steps. First, uh, we will eliminate this term. Yeah. Uh, once we have eliminated it, we use this uh, Kalman for uh, how variables of our, our hydrogen system, so for phi, psi, and eta. We had uh, so free Kalman estimate like, like, like that. And uh, if this term is not here, you can see that if you add the free Kalman estimate, you will have a term here on phi, psi, and eta. So the second step is to eliminate the observation on the right side on phi. And there's a, a, a last, uh, last step, which is uh, very easy to do after that. Uh, okay, so the first step is to, uh, I said, eliminate this term from, from the right hand side. So I recall it uh, high. So first, you can see very easily, uh, I can recall uh, here that uh, uh, phi change is a minimum on phi, of phi on uh, zero error. So, uh, of course, as you have a minus sign here, you can get easily this um, inequality here. And then we will interpolate this quantity between H73 and L2. So, the interpolation, you have this. Uh, uh, term here that appears, and after that you apply uh, Young inequality. So here you have a, a small epsilon, and we will uh, play with that to, to absorb this term from uh, the left hand side. And this term that uh, will uh, remain on the right side. Okay, so the problem is how to absorb this term. So in fact, uh, instead of uh, estimating this term on omega zero, we will estimate all this term on zero. Okay. So to do that, we apply a bootstrap argument. So we, we, we do it in two steps. First, we introduce a new variable y1 which is the product of uh, our solution y, solution of uh, the KDV equation, with a function theta1, which depends only on time, and it is written like that. So it depends only on time because here you have taken phi hat, which is the maximum of uh, phi on uh, zero. And here the, the power of S on Xi are, are well chosen to get the, the result. So if you rewrite the, the equation in Y1, on the right term, you have theta1 times J plus the derivative of in time of theta1 times Y. Okay. And you can uh, estimate uh, the derivative of theta1 that appears here and prove that f1 here is in L2. And so as f1 is in L2 with your well posedness result, you can say that y1 is in L2 H2 and you have this estimate here of a norm of y1 in this uh, space. Okay, so norm of f1 in L2 is this is uh, bonded by this term plus this one. Okay, so here you can remember that on the left side of your Kalman inequality, you have a term like that, except that instead of s at the power of 3, you have s at the power of 5. Okay, so you can do uh, better. 
So second step for your bootstrap argument is to take now new variable y2, which is theta2 times y. So it, it uh, sounds like uh, before, except that theta2 is this quantity here. So we have chosen everything to have exactly the, the orange term we wanted to estimate. So you have exactly uh, at the power, if you take theta 2 at power 2, you have exactly s psi at the power minus 3, the exponential term on the, the norm of y in the good space. Okay. And so what is very important here is to have this estimate there. So when you write the equation uh, in uh, y2, you have here theta 2g, and here, instead of writing the derivative of theta 2 in times times y, you write this quantity here, okay? And as here, you have that this quantity is less than cs, you can prove that if j is sufficiently regular, so it has to be in L2 h one third, then f2 here is also in L2 h one third, and your new variable y2 is in L2 h seven third. So you have gained here something. And when you, is, when you estimate your norm here, so it's the norm of uh, y2 in L to h7 third. It is less than, here you have some terms in j, but what is important here is this term in y2, and you have exactly the good power that uh, appears on the left side of your Kalman estimate. So that uh, this uh, quantity is already, already estimated by uh, your Kalman term. Okay, so we are done. We have proved that if your left member, your right member is sufficiently regular, so in L2 H1 third, then you have this Kalman estimate for your solution Y of your, Kalman, your KDD equation. So on the left side, you have the previous term here, this new term, which is where you see the norm of y in h7 third. And on the right side, you have only an observation on y. Okay. So here you can see that you have some new uh, weight here. So you have to suppose that uh, this quantity is uh, non negative. Okay. So you have a, a first. Uh, um, remark between uh, phi chet and phi hat, the minimum and the maximum of uh, your weight function. And you can prove a, a same type of uh, Kalman estimate with uh, the norm of y in h 8 third. Okay, so but of course you have to suppose that your term j is more regular. Okay. So now we have uh, our Kalman estimate for our single uh, KDV equation. So we had, uh, so if you remember our equation, you, the, the second variable was uh, living alone. So I just uh, mentioned the, the both equations that are coupled. Okay, so equation on phi on eta. So we had the Kalman estimate on phi in eight third plus the Kalman estimate on eta on seven third. And we have something in J1, J3, an observation on eta and an observation term on phi. Okay. So the next step now is to eliminate this term as we want to control only uh, with uh, to control. So we don't want this observation term here on the right side. 
Um, so to do that, uh, of course, we use the, the coupling between uh, eta and phi. And uh, what is important here also is that the, the coupling is of order one. So if we want to estimate uh, phi thanks to its derivative in space, we have to suppose that our uh, subset omega uh, touches one side of a boundary because you can remember that uh, phi satisfies the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So if uh, omega touches the boundary, you have this quantity or this one. It depends on you know, the side where the side where it touches uh, the boundary. And you can apply uh, some Poincaré inequality. Okay, so you have to suppose this. So if we have this uh, hypothesis, which is true, you can uh, bond this uh, term j thanks to the norm of phi x. And then you replace one of your phi x here by this term here, okay? And you hope that everything will be absorbed by the left-hand side of your Kalaman inequality. So here, for this term, this uh, uh, cross term here, it's uh, easy. For this one, uh, you just have to make an integration by part in, uh, in space but uh, it will be okay you can absorb uh, the norm of um, you, you use some young inequality to to absorb the, the second derivative in space of uh, of phi and it remains the last term here which is the most difficult one so the the product between phi, phi x and eta t Um, so, I recall here it uh, J3. Uh, to absorb this term, so uh, the, the product between uh, phi x and eta t, you make an integration by part in time and space. So you will have this first term here, but it's uh, quite easy to, to absorb the phi x here by uh, the left hand side and uh, you have a new term here which is the product with between phi t, t and the derivative of eta x so once again you use your equation so you have this equation uh, for phi so you replace here phi t by this term here. You have uh, g1 times eta x, it's okay. And you have uh, the third derivative in space of phi times eta x. So to do that, um, you uh, integrate by parts in space. So what do you have? You have a coupling between phi xx and eta xx, so this term can be absorbed by the left uh, hand side of your Kalman inequality, and it remains this term here, and that's the reason why here, I don't know if you have uh, noticed, but I uh, didn't use, I can go back, um, it was just here. Here, I used not only 8 7 third for free, but 8 a, a high 8 third. And why? It comes just from here. Because here, if you want to absorb this uh, boundary term, you must have an estimate on phi in uh, bigger than uh, 5 half so you seven third is not enough so you have to take 
page A8 first. Okay, so we, as you have a, an estimate of um, the norm of phi in H A third, you can absorb this term by the left hand side of your Kalman inequality. Okay, so we are done. We have the whole uh, Kalman in inequality for the system. So on the right side, you have uh, an observation for psi on little gamma and an observation term for eta on little omega. And here, as you have made lots of uh, Jung inequality, you have a new power for your uh, weight. It's uh, 56 phi 1 catch minus 55 phi 1 at. And that explains what at the beginning of, um, of the talk I, uh, I mentioned that we have to take a, um, a weight such that this quantity is uh, strictly positive. Okay, and you have also some uh, terms in uh, J1, J2, and J4. Okay, so now we just end the proof as usual. So um, we, as we have the, the observability inequality for the whole Eigen system, we can uh, deduce the null controllability of uh, our linear system. And we use a local inversion argument to, to get the controllability, the null controllability of the nonlinear system. It's a, a local result. I mentioned it here. So you can take a gamma. Gamma is the um, set where we control uh, only for D, as you want in the rel. Little omega must touch the boundary. So, for example, you can take uh, omega hey hell. And if you take some initial conditions sufficiently small, then we, you can find two controls, P and Q, such so that your solution at the end is new. So to conclude, I can mention two open questions. Um, so the first open question is about the, the controllability with only one internal control. Um, at the beginning of the talk, I, I say that uh, when you want to control the linear system has a V as no coupling with uh, U and W, you can only hope to control with uh, at minimum uh, two control, but when you control the nonlinear part, maybe we can control with only one internal control. So to, to do that, uh, you, you have to, to change uh, all the proof because you, you must control uh, directly the nonlinear uh, system. And um, maybe the idea is to, to use the return method of uh, Jean-Michel Coron. Maybe it could work. So. And the second question we can uh, ask is uh, about the boundary controllability. So can we control uh, this uh, system with uh, two boundary controls or, or, or less uh, controls? Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, for the nice conference. Uh, there are uh, questions, comments, or remarks. There are some questions, comments, or remarks? Okay, if you know, we thank again uh, uh, the speaker, uh, Bofo, Yavar, and Emmanuel, and uh, we start again uh, to 3 p.m. with uh, the next speaker, Jennifer Agnelli from the University of Bari, and the next chairman will be Lorena Bosch.
Thanks. Uh, good uh, good lunch and uh, also good dinner for Yamamoto.